Talk and Power, your motorsport and motoring radio show. Now on 88.5 FM, the valley comes alive. And podcasting across iTunes and talkandpower.com.au. Okay, episode 124 of the Talk and Power podcast. I'm Nick DeCembra. I'm joined by co-host Todd Brinkworth over there. How are you, Todd? I'm right. How are we going? Oh, Jesus. Now I'm loud. <laughs> we can't win tonight. <laughs> We've got a special guest in the studio, Tony Riccadello. Tony, thanks for joining us. No, thanks for having me, having me guys. Um, great to be here. Well, we've been trying to organise this one, not for, not for any reason, but it was one that I really wanted to do. Um, Tony Riccadello, tell us, growing up as the son of Basil Riccadello, tell us what, what that was like as a young kid. Pretty much being at the racetrack a lot. Um, <clears throat> watching race cars go around the track, watching Dad work hard, Mum and Dad both working hard at the servos. Um, you know, just always being around cars and, and motor racing. Do you... I've, I've said this before on previous episodes with Italians that first generation, you and I are first generation Italians, we had Phil Lamartina, top fuel champion, on the podcast as well. What do you think it is about the Italian, the the, the, the Italian migrants that came out to Australia, had children? Why there is such a strong following in the automotive scene, and why Italian um, first generation guys like yourself become so successful in that space? Mate, I think it's with any person that has passion for something i think you know if you look at them you know my parents and my uncles and aunties when they do something they have a lot of passion for it and it's something that you probably don't see as much these days you know it's just a job um when they put they have so much passion into it they put so much effort into it one a saying that my mum would always say is if you've got to do something you always do it your best it doesn't matter what it is whether you're a cleaner whether you're an architect, whatever it is, mechanic, you just got to do it the best. And I think that passion just carries carries through into bigger and better things. And, you know, Dad worked hard, started, got their first service station, got the next service station. It grew the businesses and the family. And, um, and that was it, yeah. But speaking of your father and your family, your mom, mother and father, they were, they were very successful in that space as well in the in the automotive. I will call it uh, service stations as well. Back in the day, where service stations truly were service stations, along with your uncle as well, Colin, yeah. how uh, very successful. That that yeah, as you said, that's got to be part of it, doesn't it? Because you know, if you look at the Italians that came to Australia, we've not a hell of a lot. They, they really made the best that they possibly could in this, in, in, certainly in Perth, Western Australia as well. Yeah, and back in the day, it was um, a service a service station where they'd come out, see how much fuel you want, um, check your oil and water, check your tyres. There was that communication with customers. They appreciated it. It was quite a bit different to what it is now. And I even see days that Dad and Uncle Colin and, and that would walk on, to the, on the driveway of the servo that we've, you know, we're not involved in anymore. We've got it leased off. You walk around, talk to customers, and and just want to help them, you know. And I think that's part of what they do. It, it was, and I remember. Like this goes back to '92. I went into your uncle's service station as a 17 year old, and I drove in there. Ding, ding, oh, the thing. He came out, pumped the tires up, and checked the, you know, checked the oil. And he goes, now you're onto a good thing here, you know. Like, and and he showed. Not that I really needed to be shown, but he showed me exactly what to do, what to check on the car, even though I had a fair fair idea of that. You, you just don't see that anymore. That Those those sort of days are gone, aren't they? Yeah, and plus he'd probably sneak in a short black with you and, <laughs> you know, and, you know, like an espresso or, or just... And I think those sort of things now become friendships too. Like yeah. back then, a friendship was a customer as well. Now mm. it's a little bit different. Everyone's life, lifestyles are busy. They get their fuel, they take off and they move on and mm. they go to any server where before you had that communication with that person and, and you become friend, friends and then have, have a long life friendship, you know. Mm. But a lot of people that I talk to still frequent your business in terms of servicing and, and repairs on cars. So that's that's good to know, isn't it? I mean, I know that the, the workshop that, that, that you, you make a living, that you and your father make a living from is a very busy one, isn't it? 
Yeah, and I mean, the industry's taken off this last few years, I guess because of this whole COVID thing, but, um, and people can't get out of, out of Australia and out of the state, so they're getting their cars fixed and they're travelling more, so a lot of four-wheel drives and other bits and pieces. But, you know, Dad started the business in 1966 and, you know, we don't advertise, we don't do none of that. It's just mm. yeah, regular it's customers, you know, word of mouth. Um, I've got some good guys that work there. They've got passion for cars and stuff. Mm. Um, brother-in-law's there, Elio. Um, he's been there for a lot of years, done his apprenticeship there. So there's there's good people around and you try to do the right thing, you try to keep everyone happy. And if you don't, you try to solve it quickly and, mm. and move on, you know, yeah. so it's old school mm. um, sort of sort of learnings that we've had. We bring it into, the, to, to, into today, so yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. I want to read a statement from a website that I that I found, and I, I don't know who wrote this. I should have checked. I don't. I don't think it was Noonan's. He. I checked another one of his websites. Might have been Noons, but I want to read this out. It says Tony Riccadello is an enigma of Australian motorsport, a massively successful sports sedan driver. Now that statement, I think, rings true. Let, let's just. You, you probably don't want to agree with that. I mean, I, at the end of the day, it's very difficult for me to ask you that question, and I don't want to. I don't want to say ask you that, but I do perceive you as an enigma as well. You're kind of the. the let's just go through some figures here. 12, 12 championships. Eleven. 11. 11 sorry, eleven. Yeah. Eleven championships. One hundred and thirty-three wins. This could be incorrect. I'm not sure, but it wouldn't be too far off the mark. One hundred and thirty-three wins. One hundred and ninety-seven podiums. Forty-five pole positions, and ninety-seven fastest laps. That's not a record that you many Australian drivers would would have under their belt. How tell us how hard was it as a kid to get to that to this where we where you are today. Um, look, you've always got to have some help, you know. You've always got different people in the background helping you. Um, the car was racing before I, you know, started driving it, so Brian Smith was driving it mm. prior um, to this car that we've got now, which was bought, uh, built in 92. There was a couple more before that. Um, I, I don't know, like, I think just the, the passion that I had in cars and... You know, if you see me at the racetrack, I'm the first one at the track, I'm the last one to leave, um, and the team. It's one of those things that we just strive for, I guess, perfection that we can try to do um, for the next day. And, and everyone that's involved in the car, we don't we don't associate with a lot of people at the track. We're pretty much there to race. We're not there to have a beer. We're not there to, you know, whatever. So we, we just keep going. And, and the guys that I've got in my circle have the same sort of passion. So... We just you just got to keep lifting, raising the bar, as as I said. You yeah. Know, as I said. Yeah, yeah. No, agreed, agreed, wholeheartedly. There. You'd mentioned Brian Smith. Tell us a bit about that era. Like, we're so we're sort of talking in the eighties here now as well. So the first, the first two Alpha Romeos. Tell us a bit about that Brian Smith era. Um, yeah, Brian, pretty much um, drove the car for Dad. I think mm-hmm. Dad's last race was probably the year I was born in 1979 I think he done the Wanneroo 300 I think we've um might have been Neville Cooper or someone and um pretty much he worked all night put a new gearbox in this alpha mm-hmm. and then um when he hopped in the car he was sick threw up in the car got mm-hmm. out and that was it and that was pretty much the last time he, he, he drove and then you know uh, over a few years they built another car which was um I think it was the second car which was built in Perth yep. in 1983 and Brian was driving that mm-hmm. um, and just the level that they had the car at was pretty much Brian Smith v Dick Ward mm-hmm. in his yep. um, RX-7 so mm. and we were the first person to break the 60s 59s 58s 57s at, at Barbagello so um, yeah the level was already there We'll just keep lifting it. You've got 54, haven't you, as well? Yeah. Uh, 53-1. Oh, 50. Oh, jeez. Oh, so right. we broke the, um, the John Bauer. Well, oh, you've gone quicker than... Oh, wow, in 1984, yeah. Wow. I haven't done my research very well yeah. then. Sorry. I have a question without notice. I said, I remember seeing the car from the mid-90s. I used to frequent one room myself a lot. Yeah. And I'm good mates with Dick Ward. I remember being up there watching you do the battle. 
When did you start pedaling the car a lot around Wanneroo? I'm trying to remember the exact year. Um, so I started driving it in 97. Yep. And what, what happened that year, uh, Brian Smith uh, drove it at Indy that year and had an accident coming into turn one at the Indy Surface Paradise ra- uh, racetrack. Into turn one, hit the wall at backwards at 300k an hour. Yeah. And... I said to Dad, well, look, the car's bent, let me have a crack. So then we did the state titles. And um, in, in 97, we won that. I broke the lap record. Then we went national in 98. Yeah, okay. All right. Now, that's that's interesting because I, I started going to Barbagallo early 90s as well. And I have fond memories of this car, but I didn't remember the Brian Smith name all that well. I do vaguely remember it, but I remember it more as yours. You know what yeah. I mean? You're, you were you were driving the car. Tell us that one that they were looking at on the screen right now. Um, for those who were watching at home, we're looking at at, at uh, Tony's car on the screen here. That one you said before, built in 1992. It's 30 years old, yet that car is still <laughs> super super competitive. Tell us like. When I saw you the other day, caught up with you, that car was like down to its frame, basically. Yeah. Tell us the maintenance and, and, the, and the work to keep that car 30 years old and still so super competitive. What's, what goes into that? So pretty much um, we'd normally race over East all year in the National Series. So we'd spend pretty much from when the car gets back in its last meeting, you know, November, December, and rebuild the whole car pretty much up until February. And then the engine was rebuilt, transaxles rebuilt. The whole, pretty much the whole, whole car goes, we put new axles, new drive shafts, new stub axles, and then we go east. And pretty much our truck um, has a full maintenance schedule that we carry with us. So you know, every couple of meetings or every meeting, rotors, brake rotors, um, gear ratios get changed. And pretty much, for since I've been doing it, that's what's happened. So the level to keep the car going around the track is very high. Mm. And the way the points have been set up is that because it's so close, if you have a DNF, if you fall back behind, it's very mm. hard to get that back. So firstly, you've got to finish the races. Um, yep. Secondly, we don't go crazy in changing a lot of things mm. every year. We pretty much, you know, you, you put more power into it then you start breaking axles. So you strengthen the axles, then you start breaking something else. And, and it's a bit of a rotation of different things. Um, if we find that the car's getting slower, we go back to a setup that we know. Hmm. Um, just so that it's easier to get lost with these things. And sometimes, yep. you know, the transition from what we had in 98 with MoTeC and all the, um, I guess, all the um, data on the car, hmm what it is now it's easy to get lost yep. and if you don't have a, a big understanding of how that works it's very easy to get lost so mm. then you know then you start bringing different guys to the track so you can read the data properly and i still drive through the seat of my pants pretty much yep um i look at the data and sort of just make it suit you know don't chase the data don't chase what i'm driving sometimes it could be tires you just got to keep it very simple Hmm. Well, I understand that. I, I caught up with one of your friends, a good friend of yours, Richie, the other day, and we we're having a long chat about this car, and I and he knew as well. But Aaron Noonan attributed this car. He's and for those that are listening at home, Aaron Noonan, um, V8 sleuth, keeps a track of all chassis numbers and race wins. You know, you and you do know this. I know that, but <laughs> you're, that is the most winningest car in Australian history of motorsport. That, that chassis, that car is the most winningest car of all the cars, even higher than Beth. That's Jamie Wincup's Commodore. Um, I think that's an amazing accolade. Yeah, and I think the world as well. It's pretty, it's okay. pretty high. Yeah. yeah. That's an amazing accolade. And to have that here in our backyard in Western Australia, you know, it makes, I know I know a lot of people that I talk to, it makes us awfully proud. It's like, it feels like, you know, when you drive that car, you're taking on you're taking on the world. You know what I mean? And yeah. that's how that's how I think a lot of West Australians feel about that vehicle. Yeah, and the thing is, everyone says, "Oh, you know, build a new car, build a new car, blah blah." blah. And the thing is, the car is pretty much brand new underneath every year that we race. Um, the body shell is the only the only new thing, and or the old thing. And the shape has varied over the years with um, aerodynamics and and um, 
different rule changes and stuff, but that car there still got the steel roof from the original car. It's got the steel doors, still got the same steel plenums, where a lot of the new cars have got carbon fibre everything. So there's still a lot of heritage in that car, but mm. it's as quick as any car in Australia. Let, so let's just qualify this for, for the listeners at home. So some people are saying, what on earth is this car that they're talking about for those that don't, don't. It's an Alfa Romeo. Um, GTV, yep. that one. It races under the sports sedan category, and I'm going to read this directly from the sports sedan uh, website, National Sports Sedan website. Sports sedan car- category is one where freedom of expression is regarded as a legitimate means to an end, and that end is performance, and lots of it. Thundering 700 plus horsepower V8s, whispering turbos, and wailing rotaries. I think that's a real, you know. If you were to look at the sports sedan category, that's exactly, if you look at all the cars, that's what it is. And, and this car is a perfect representation of the sports sedan category. Tell us a bit, like Simon always talks about, he wants his cars to look exaggerated, like comic book cars, you know, something that you read at, that you see in a magazine. Tell us a bit about the, the, the look and, and what, what the... The, the running gear of this car as well, like the, the Chev powered, it's it's kind of almost mid-mounted. Tell us a bit about it. Yeah, so pretty much early on, back in the day where they started the sports sedans, you pretty much put big tyres. Then you make the flares you know, or, the, or the guards go to the tyres. And they're pretty... The, the rules have changed now, but what you see is a exaggerated shape of the car. So mm. bulging guards, um, big tyres... A lot of attitude, you know, the spoilers. And, and people always say, you know, they're always going to be the quickest because it's so open with the rules. But the rules are pretty specific. And you've got to remember where, I guess, backyard is in a way in mm. motorsport compared to V8 supercars and all the other GD3s and all this different stuff. So for this sort of car to be three, four seconds quicker at most tracks, if not more, than V8s and a lot of the other categories, that's quite impressive so this car is pretty much mid-mounted uh chev you got a maximum of six liter mm-hmm. um it's got a transaxle in the rear mm-hmm. so which means that you've got the diff in front of the, the the gearbox so then you can change gear ratios to suit every yep. track and what holds it together is a torque tube so it's like a big tube for really strong r- rigidity um at the front it's a lot of air box and cooling systems and and different bits and pieces um all the suspensions chromoly um yeah so it's that's pretty much what it is you know it's pretty much an open wheeler with a with a body shell on it <laughs> yeah but do you think then looking at our premier category v8 supercars or supercars do you think we've lost our way a little bit with that category if if with these cars here i think these are the cars that people want to see or this is what we want to see happen to our cars or this is much, much more appealing to me uh, than what a V8 supercar is. Do you think we've kind of lost our way a bit? Look, if you look at the, the new cars that they're trying to build and stuff, it's it's becoming sports sedan mm. style. So the sports sedans, people love watching them, the noise, the attitude and all that. And I think they're trying to adopt a bit of sports sedan. But then you also look at, they're trying to get rid of downfall. So they're going sort of a NASCAR spec thing. So I think they're stuck in the middle of different avenues. Mm. Um, then you go on the GD3 because they've got paddle shifts. They haven't got, you know, so they're, they're sort of grabbing bits that they want to grab from different categories. Yeah. I guess it's one of those things that all the cars look very similar mm. yeah. in the end. You know, there's one or two different companies building the chassis. Yeah building pedal boxes, building building this and that. Where sports sedans, we get, we we build all our own cars, Mm. you know. So they're quite different when you look at them. Um, So it's it's one of those things, but, you know, V8 supercars is a lot of money getting spent um, in each team. But there's, you know, it's, you got different avenues to look at it. You know, when I was racing V8s, every chassis that you got, it was an unknown where mm. now it's a bit more controlled so then yeah. you get getting quite a few different winners in different 
mm. you know, new guys coming in yeah. where before it was always the top teams that won. So, mm. but you know, it's it's everyone's got different opinions, and I guess it's the same thing that we were talking about before: is new people come in, they want to change it to suit themselves. Mm. Um, they the next person comes along, they change it for something else. Mm. You know, so it's just it's just a big revolving restaurant, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tony, tell us a bit. Well, you you touched on the supercar scene there. You did a stint at Bry Tech, and then you also did a stint at Kelly Brothers as well. What was that like then? In that, that was sort of '06, and then even two thousand and ten. What was that like making the switch from from that car to to a supercar? What did you need to do to prepare for it? Well, I actually did my first V eight race with Thomas from Zero back mm. in '99. Um, and then I did a bit of Young Lions stuff, holding Young Lions. Um, drove for Dick Johnson, done the Brightech stuff and the Kellys. And, and like I was saying earlier, is that every chassis that you got was slightly different. So it was always a bit of a struggle because they were two or three years old or four years old or, mm. you know, like certain chassis had certain enigmas. So this chassis would have problems with pedal boxes and this chassis has had problems with okay. understeer and oversteer and all these different different things. So, look, I, I, looking back at it, it was probably, I learnt a lot and probably wouldn't change it. Mm. But moving forward, when I have, when people ask me about it, I try to give them different avenues to look at to make sure they don't make the same mistakes I did. But also it's, it's quite different now. So, the chassis are quite similar, so it's it's it, it was it was good experience. Um, yeah, because two two of your sparring partners have had have dabbled in the supercars as well. We've seen uh, Darren Hossack uh, did a stint in supercars, or oh, it might have been touring cars when he did when he dabbled in it. Yeah, and even now we're seeing Thomas Randall as well. You know, super talent as well. You I mean do you talk to those guys much and tell them what what like Thomas Randall what to expect over at in Supercar yeah, Land? Look, I mean me and Darren Hossack, we're um, we're both has-beens, mate. You know, we talk about it, so we look at old photos and stuff. And he was originally one of the wins. He was wins yeah. um, sort of uh, figureheads for them, and I think back then you had to be. It was a bit of a boys' club back yep. when I was racing. Now it's. It's more business mm. orientated, and and any opportunity, whether it's in the first team or the the last team on the grid, you're going to have a good opportunity. So, I think Thomas has probably come into the V8s at a good time. He's obviously got a lot of support from certain people, mm. and I think he's going to do he's he's going to do a good job. You know, yeah. like he's he had he had um, a few challenges last year with different with cancer and stuff like that. Mm. He's come out of that. And I think his vision on, on what he's doing now, he's matured quite a bit, and I think he's got going to have a good good run. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean, oh, I've been watching him from afar, and I know what the sort of the the, the stint he's done in um, the sports sedan and, and watching him quite closely in supercars. So we wish him, we wish him the very best. You've also, I didn't know this, but in my research, I saw you did the Bathurst 12 hour in an Evo. There you go, Todd, one for you. Yeah, Evo 10. <laughs> yeah. That was with uh, Glenn Crimp and uh, Stewie Costera. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, that was a good experience. We had um, Glenn Crimp was was the, the person that was organising and funding mm. a lot of it. Um, he had uh, West Racing, it was called back then, and myself and Stuart were both the co drivers. Um, and yeah, we came second in that one against um, um, the Mitsubishi Evo team, so the Rally Art team. Yep. And um, yeah, that was a good experience. We actually we got the quickest lap time and we were probably in it for a win, but we had a tyre delaminate, so our pit stop strategy sort of got got uh, modified slightly up, up until the end, but that was good. Yeah, that was really different again, you know, different to V8s. So that was an all-wheel drive thing, mm. four-cylinder four turbo. Um, probably not as intense, so you could probably enjoy it a bit more. But yep. there were still big names back then, which Longhurst, mm. Damien White, and all those guys who have been XV8 supercar drivers. And yeah, it was good, good experience. But we're seeing now even SVG have a dabble in the Bathurst 12 hour as well. And we're seeing a number of the supercar drivers and, and you know, make their way into Bathurst 12 hour. I think that's a, a new emerging market, really, in terms of, of Australian motorsport. And that, 
Yeah, I just I, I watch that from afar, and I think we've been talking about it on the podcast a lot, and I think it's it's certainly something that we should be watching quite closely. Yeah, I mean the twelve hour back then was more production car orientated, so it was mm. you know the Evos, the Lance, um, the WRXs, a few BMWs. Where now that twelve hours gone up to, you know, all the hours yeah. and and the, so the levels, the GT three cars, the levels change quite a bit. So. You know, imagine going to Bathurst with a Evo 10. You know, the cost is, I guess, still going to be high, but it's controllable. When you go to these newer cars, you know, which are GT3 spec, mm. there's, yep. there's big dollars. And, yeah. and then it sort of limits the people that can go and race the 12 hour. So I guess it's good that, they, you know, SVG and all these guys are doing it. Um, but I guess it's taken that opportunity away from a lot of the less or more amateur racing guys that can go and have a bit of fun yeah just because the level's so expensive yeah 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 i think it might have been the six hour svg did this this year he did the six hour and and it was a bmw because it wasn't a 12 hour this year yeah there it wasn't it was just the six hour (laughs) yeah it's just something very interesting i think you're right i think it's something but i noticed that some of the networks we won't mention them here but some of the networks are really starting to push that production racing as well and i even noticed on the weekend uh, a fair bit of coverage from the supercars in in uh, sydney they had a production race there as well and that got a lot prime time on on foxtel as well so it's good to see there's a return to production car production car racing as such and and it's starting to make the the tv i guess yeah i think like last weekend in the first um eastern creek round they had the new south wales sports events so a lot of club level races um and that's probably the good thing that this COVID's brought is that because you can't travel a lot of the state level um sort of categories can have a have an opportunity to race at the v8s mm, so yeah. which which and they're getting prime tv and all that stuff so mm. that's that's a good thing that's happened out of it um, definitely so then you got the formula fords are back into it just just on the weekend just gone the production cars mm. so i guess that's good for motorsports that you're getting i guess old school style racing where you got the v8s and then you got the state level guys and they're having they got the crowds in front of them and, and, and enjoying themselves on TV. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Speaking of COVID, you, you mentioned COVID there. In 2020, you did the E-Series, so the Australian Sports Sedan E-Series. What was that like? Tell us tell us a bit about that. I was I was curious to see how you went there. Well, Good. It was a bit of fun, which was it kept your eye in. And I've yeah. got my own sort of set up at home, which, um, which I use. And my young fellow Orlando has, has a go on as well, so... <laughs> Let's just say COVID never comes back ever again, and, and God, we, we sincerely hope it doesn't. But do you think there's a future for E-Series, even in a normal world? Yeah, I think so. Like, I think it was there before. It probably just wasn't as advertised. And mm. then with nothing happening in the world, yep. um, you can race from home. Um, you can be safe, and you can just... And the simulator side of things is, is quite realistic. Mm. Um, certain... You know, like iRacing has, has quite a few different cars that you can drive, you know, different tracks. Um, the feel of the car was quite quite good. But then also, you know, you've got these sim racers who are top-level sim racers. And mm. no matter how good you think you are, those guys just kill you on the track. Like, it's amazing the difference in, in styles to get the speed out of the sim racing top guys. Simon and I don't agree on this, but he thinks a sim racer can make a good racer. I, I completely disagree. Do you think a sim racer can make a good... Like, you get it, the best, the best sim racer, and you go put him in that. Do you think he'll be as fast? To drive that and other sports that ends, it's a different feeling, right? So when you, when you race a sim... You know, and no disrespect to any sim drivers because there's some good guys out there and I struggled to even stay near them. And you drive, your feel's different, you know, so you've only got, um, I mean, I've got a Fanatec sort of direct drive unit and pedals and stuff, but the feel that you get through the through the wheel is way different to what it is on in a rural car. But I guess you look at SVG and... and well, the, the, the Kostecki boys, 
they're top level sim racers mm. and top level race car drivers. So, but they started from a racing side yeah. of things and then went sim racing. And and there's a lot of little tricks that they've probably learned too. And you know, they, I think they've proven that, that a lot of sim racers can race cars. But I think this type of car is different, where you've got like a GD3 car, you're sitting in the capsule. You know, all those ones in in Japan, the Nippon cars and and sports cars their capsule they have full electronics this has still got h pattern you still got to clutch it you know there's a lot of different things that they probably wouldn't even know what's happening you know but th- <laughs> this is the point that i was trying to make before as well even with simon there's a there's a visceral feeling inside that so let's just say we're inside that you got you know on a sim you don't have that visceral feeling no. you, you don't have you don't have the noise. You don't have this vibrations. The, the vibration. Yeah. You don't have Greg Crit sitting in your blind spot, yeah. knowing <laughs> that he's gonna he's gonna pounce on you. It, it's a. I just don't. And you drive to the limits different because you know that you're not gonna hit the fence and smash a car. You drive to the limit and past it. Where I think a sim racer would 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 certain sim racers may struggle in finding that limit because. The limit is the fence, mm. you know. So to tr- to be able to be that close to, you know, ten tenths, like a lot of the top guys, that's very difficult in a real car. Yeah. And and we're not talking, you know, we're talking thousands, and mm. you know, and every corner, it's got to be precise, and you can't go past the limit. You can't just spin off and go on the grass and hit the fence <laughs> and reset. Yeah. That's the difference, you know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely concur, and I, I, I'd still, I disagree with him vehemently. But I, yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll bring that debate up for another day. It's a good training technique, though. Yeah, like, it's oh, good for training. Certainly. A lot of guys are using it. There's mm. different um, companies around WA that have got top sims. Mm. I know that um, Thomas Randall's got his own sim sort of coaching style of things, and it's a good tool. Mm. But then to put it in into real life. You've mm. got to just remember it's a tool. Yeah. It's like yep. all the IT and the data that you've got. It's only a tool. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, uh, I concur. You mentioned your son Orlando before. So tell us a bit about him. He's had his first win in carts just recently, I saw. But from what I understand, he's also very good at soccer as well. So how do you manage, like as, you, as his father, how do you mentor him in trying to be good at both and do you have a passion for him to go down one path or the other look it's, it's it is difficult i know that and i'm going back to covid covid stopped a lot of my racing over east and that's yeah. probably been a little bit of a blessing in a way where i've been doing it for so many years that now i don't i can't go so pretty much the weekends is soccer or go-karts or you know and it's just constantly this every weekend's flat out um when I was younger, I did soccer, I did BMX, go-karts, um, different things. And I think, and I keep saying to Orlando and other people that ask why he's doing both, is because one's a team sport and one's a sport in a way that it's you only. Mm. You know, So I think you learn different things from both. And I guess one thing as an individual when you're racing cars can help you in, in soccer and vice versa. Mm, yeah. Because you come from a family of sporting people, really. I mean, we were talking about your cousin Tony before as well. He's very uh, highly regarded in the football scene, yeah. in the AFL football scene. Uh, yourself in soccer as well. So it must be, you know, it, it must be hard for him as well to decide which which path he wants to go down as a, as a young star. Um, we only wish, like as a kid, I wish I wasn't good at anything really, any sports or anything like that. So it's, he's in an enviable position, but it must be hard mentoring him into deciding which way to go. Yeah, look, last year it was a different year and I found that we couldn't even talk about things in the car on the way home from sport. Mm. So I took a step back and I was like, you know what, just go there, smile and have fun. So every time we go racing, whether it's a state championships, whether it's, the final for soccer or whatever it is, go and have fun. And he's actually grown and improved quite a lot. So I think 
it's funny, I talked with like guys um, back in my BMX days, Daniel Sprague, who's still involved now. His son's a racing go-karts and he was a world champion and the Figlaminis and mm. all those guys, is that we as parents put a lot of pressure on our kids and it's easier to become a BMX dad mm. where you just go there and it, it just becomes hounding. Where I'm pretty serious with racing, but I try to keep it tight and i try to let him just have fun and not throw too many things at him and i do changes without telling him let him go play with the other kids and stuff so it's 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 very difficult Mm. and there's a lot of parents there that i feel like just saying guys just step back you know like you're living this dream for your kid and i I don't even know if your kid wants to be there like it's just (laughs) it's pretty difficult but i guess we all parent our kids in different ways and um you just got to keep having fun because the years tick by does it make it hard for him, like son of Tony Ricky? Yeah, Dalley? early on it did because he he was you know if he came third or fourth he would say to me oh you know you never come third or fourth and I was like well hang on when I did BMX I came seventh out of eight two or three years I came second for three years in a row mm. I came fourth then I went to racing cars and it was a different thing so I said you're not me so don't worry about it when we go racing if you come second and you did your best, then I'm happy with it. But mm. if you if you go there and you don't put your effort in and then you're disappointed later, well, then that's yeah. what you get. So, yeah. I don't know, I tried to, yeah, not put too much pressure on him. Yeah, because I can imagine it, it would be, not, no, I don't know, I shouldn't say tough, but, yeah, it would, be, it would be inherent pressures on him. And I've spoken to a number of siblings. We spoke with Emma Begley as well. She's a drag racer, father and brother have done so well in the sport. And I always wonder, does it put a lot of pressure on them? And they say no, but I think it inherently yeah. it does, yeah. of course. I mean, with, with um, soccer, you know, I've got, I'm assistant coach at the Perth Soccer Club with the under 11s this year. And I've got a guy called um, Coach Marcus. And our deal is I'll look after his kid and he looks after mine. So, yeah. so we sort of keep that separate, you know, so... We don't even talk about it on the way home. Mm. He, he makes sure, he, you know, Marcus makes sure that um, Orlando's doing the right thing on the pitch and, and I'll make sure Amir's doing the right thing. And, and that's how we deal with it. So we're there, but we're not, if yeah, you know what I mean. So, yeah. No, yeah. That, that, that makes sense. That, that does make sense. Getting back to, we were talking about lap records at Wanderer Raceway. So I had this I had this all incorrect. But tell us, give us some of your memories of what's well, well, called Wanderer Raceway again, but Barbara Geller of Wanderer Raceway, whatever you want to call it. Tell us some of, I remember fondly the Nightmasters series as well. Yeah. Uh, back in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, they even had a, they had a NASCAR race there as well at one stage. I, I think you were there that night, actually. Yeah. I do remember that. Tell us like some of the good memories at Wanneroo Raceway. I guess it's your home track. Yeah, the Night Masters was always good fun, and it was night racing, and and you had a mix of cars and categories together, and they were sprint formats, and and I think it was just just good fun racing. You know what mm. I mean? Like you'd start obviously we were the quickest, and we'd start from the back, and Dick Ward would be there. Um, guys like Grant Johnson would be there. Um, right. yeah. Grant Johnson. Yeah. You know, some of the V8 supercar drivers would be there. John Bow drove the Cat Falcon there a few times yeah. when that was back in Perth. Um, going from that, to, they had some NASCARs and they had the truck racing and that sort mm. of stuff. So that was – truck racing was, was good. Um, yeah. And then when we went to Iron Park, obviously, that was quite big over there with the truck racing. But, yeah, look, I, I don't know, I think – it feels like sometimes when you look back, it's all a bit of a blur, mm. you know, and you've actually got to go back and look at all people have to bring, you know, the Night Masters up or um, when, you, when I race the V8s with Brightech or, or whatever it is to trigger that memory, you know. So there were so many, it's, you know, there's, I was 18 years old mm. when I started in the Alpha and, and sort of became pretty competitive. Um, now I'm 42. 22 years it's all passed pretty quickly and there's a lot of I don't even remember some of the 11 championships that I won you know so because it was just so full on you get this routine of the national series Hmm. and then you come back to Perth and you might do a a Perth round and then you put the car in the truck and then you go east and that whole revolving you know motorsport sort of um, I don't know amateur professional racing Hmm. that we did it just happened 
yeah. constant. Now you look back and you think, gee, 20 years is gone. Yeah, yeah. That's a magnificent 20 years, Tony, I must say. And uh, you and your family should be really proud of your accomplishments. As a West Australian, we're all proud of that. You know, yeah. not just the car, yourself, your, your family and everything you've done. Talk us through your crew. You mentioned the crew before. I, I don't know. I, I think it's Jamie Gard. Is that right? Glenn Baker, are they some of them? Is that yeah, right? Jamie yeah. Gard, he's, um, he, he's still around. He's actually helping... Um, Joe Ricardo doing a bit of stuff. Um, Glenn Baker's still around, so he's Autosport Electronics. Um, mm. There's been heaps of guys like um, Mark Colin yep. with the body work, you know, from his panel beating days, he's mm-hmm. always been there. Um, Castrol, Bendigo Bank, all those guys. Rob Mitchell early on, Paul Roberts, who's passed, Vince Collins, um, Louis Delana, who was Guru Welding, assisted with a lot of things. Um, mm. There's been so many guys, you know, less small over in, in Melbourne. Oh, the um, engine builder. Yeah, so yep. he, he's the one that was did the um, chickadee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, VK the VK, Commodores, yeah. Um, with Graham Bailey, I think. Mm. And done a lot of NASCAR stuff and built a lot of cars. Um, yeah, so there's, mate, there's some Bob Tindall, who passed yep. away. Yep. He, he was um, from Sydney and then came to live in Perth for a bit and helped us with the car early on with different roll centre changes and stuff on it from mm. when it was originally built. Um, yeah, but like, there's still the same guys. Like, you know, Jamie's always been involved. Mm-hmm. Glenn's always been involved. Even from when he was back at the Slaco days, you know, he yep. was Sarah's apprentice. Um, Tim Slaco early on. So there's there's so many guys over the years that have put in a little bit of effort. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And your sponsors, give them, give them a plug. Far away with your sponsors there. Yeah, who... look, we've got North Perth Bendigo Bank, West Isle, mm-hmm. um, which is my cousin's um, building company. Um, JD Spray Painting, so John Regali's doing all our spray painting work and always preps the car. Um, ICT, which is some of the fuel treatments, and they do a lot of car wash chemicals for us. Okay. Because um, yep. we've got a car wash mm-hmm. Perth Car Spa. Yep. Perth Car Spa sponsors. Being at being in Mercadella Motors, of course. obviously they're involved. <laughs> um, yeah, so Toes R Us, Don DeMarty helps us out with getting the car where it needs to be. Mm. Um, yeah, so there's been, mate, there's been so many over the years. Yep. Um, and now, because I'm not racing at the moment, Orlando has been carrying a few of those sponsors on yeah. on his go kart to get their names out there, and even back in the sim days, you know, last year and year before, we had them involved. So it was yep. a good bit of fun. Yeah. Yep. Can you tell us on there? We can cut this out if you want, but the new car. Can you talk about that, or is it, it's off limits? <laughs> no, no, it it's you... mate. The new car's been a new car for a lot of years. <laughs> <mate>. <laughs> the problem is, um, there's been a lot of things getting in the way. So yeah. you know, the business is constantly busy. Um, and everything happens and yeah other, other performance things that i've been doing for customers and, and my own stuff but um the new car's still ticking over and it's still getting you know we've done a lot of pretty much 98 percent of the drawings have been done and a lot of that those bits have been machined up so myself and jamie gard have been doing a lot of that um camco engineering do all our machine work from years back so pretty much you know all our drive shafts all our axles um mm. uprights our uprights are one piece chrome molly mm-hmm. machined out so and that was that was in the 90s you know what i mean early 90s that we've had them and yeah. slightly modified them over the years so we've been doing a lot of cnc spec style stuff for years you know but um you wouldn't think under the old girl has got any of that but um <laughs> yeah so the, the new car's slowly going yeah the jig's made we've got all the material it's just um trying to get the time to do it yeah well it must be hard as well going committing to a new car when you've got you know a proven car here as well that's got 30 years of history and and it's a it's a it's a proven winner must yeah. be hard to commit to a new car as well and find the time to yeah commit to and, a new and you car. gotta look at the sports sedan so pretty much everything on that car mm-hmm. is built other than the engine and transactional yeah everything's handmade so the pedal box is handmade mm. fabricated everything yeah you know what i mean so to go ahead and build a new car and build all those little oil tanks and all those reservoirs and, mm-hmm. and brackets and it's a lot of work yep. and 
it's not like building a production car because mm. you can just buy things off the shelf slap them on there and you're done mm. yep. so there's a lot of things on that even to the body all the perspex and everything like it's there's a lot of work in it yeah, yeah. so even yep. just to rebuild a car that you've already built is is a lot of work so mm. but anyway we'll get there yeah, yeah no no we're looking forward to it and what's the plans for this soul girl then once you get the new car I don't know if, if the new car's not ready by the time I'm driving it maybe Orlando might and I'll have to race this one still <laughs> so I don't, I don't know but um, this car will be staying like in one piece it won't be yeah. getting stripped they won't lose any parts from it to, to go on the new one it'll be a full brand new car um, all the transactions there like pretty much the torque tube the engine a lot of the suspension brackets mm. they're all made um, so a lot of those little pain in the ass jobs have been made yeah so then it's just a matter of putting it together so yeah yeah now my only reason why i'm asking is i sincerely hope this car we see this car staying around in western australia and and in, in your possession because i think it's it's an important part of west australian history i put it up there with uh zaps rat and and yeah. th- and those sort of cars you know i think it's really important to to our history wayne negus's tirana as well those sort of cars i think this really is as you said the most winningest car of all time or as aaron noonan said the most winningest car of, in australian history and as you pointed out possibly the world mm. it's important that you know uh, I, I sincerely hope it stays here in western australia and it's part of the ricardello family for a long time to come yeah i couldn't see couldn't see a selling it this one but um <laughs> yeah look i mean it's yeah it's too much history in it yeah yeah no fair enough yeah, for sure yeah Tony, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast. It's been great, and I really enjoyed it. It's a walk back down memory lane, and you like pointed out a lot of things to me that I didn't even know. So uh, we really appreciate you coming along to the podcast, and uh, we might get you on with Orlando in a few years to come, and uh, we can have a chat with him as well. Yeah, no worries. No, it's been good good to be here, and um, mate, it's it's, it's you, you set off a few memories in my in my mind, and I'm trying to think back to you. See, that was a while ago, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I do. I, I just when I did my research, the 09 season with Darren Hossack, I think used to came together at Oran Park, was it, or somewhere? It was raining. Malala. Malala, sorry, yeah, yeah Malala, and uh, yeah, a lot of these things. I've been watching a heap of video as well on the car, and wait, what a yeah, that was that was a pretty that was an intense weekend, and. I remember after that race getting taken out. I think I don't know if that cost me the championship, but I had Carla, my wife, on my back. Pretty much, I was ready to have a punch on, you know. <laughs> and um, I think it was a couple of years later that me and Darren actually, like now we talk about it. We got passion for Tiranas and stuff like that. That we we spoke about it, and it was like, man, we just we went able. You know what I mean? Like we went. That win was everything, and. Mm then we started actually enjoying racing that if we have a bit of a rub or a bit of a hit you sort of get over it but i don't know i think we'll we're trying to prove something as well i think that was sort of close to our v8 career you know sort of taken off and i don't know i think you sort of miss just having a bit of fun but that was pretty intense and um he yeah, did. It was he, good fun. Look, with respect to Darren Hossack, he did die. He dive bombed you. Eh? I mean, I, I, when I yeah. watched the video, I was like, "Oh, Darren." Yeah. That's not I mean, good, if anyone's eh? raced at Malala before, that is a bumpy track, and pretty much that section there, there's really only one lo- one lane <laughs> in, and I think the track was drying, and he went up the inside, yeah. and he pretty much just locked the fronts and just nailed me. Yeah. And um, we had a, we've always had an issue with the Alpha with starter motors, and I remember it just went. Dunk. It wouldn't start. And pretty much that was it. And um, yeah, and then hit the fan pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I saw. I was watching that, and some of your tussles even with Thomas as well, Randall, or whatever. Yeah, look, it's there's a lot of history there. I watched a lot of video, and uh, I think, yeah, as I said, I have fond memories of this car. Everyone does. Every West Australian, every West Australian motorsport would have fond memories of this vehicle, your family and everything you've done and contributed to to not only the Wanneroo Raceway and Barbagalla Raceway, but to, to, to our motorsport fans here uh, right across the right across the state. So it's been a pleasure having you I on here, Tony. Yeah, no, yeah. no worries. Hopefully um, the Alpha's pretty close to getting back together, so we might have a run soon. We'll just see how we go. 
No, it sounds good. good. I know. I know you're a member of the the club as well. So maybe we'll, we'll uh, have to do a bit of a show where you can bring it out as well and yeah, yeah, get the it. get the members all excited. That's it. No <laughs> Hey, Tony, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for coming yeah, in Yeah, that's well. right. I was just here for the stories. It was great, you know. <laughs> so. The nice cannolis in the stories. Yeah, that's it. it's great. Yeah, that's <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tony. That's Take sweet. care. Thank you. See ya. Talk and Power, your motorsport and motoring radio show. Now on 88.5 FM, the valley comes alive. And podcasting across iTunes and talkandpower.com.au.